Um, I'm assuming most people here are, are developers, right? Everyone here is a developer? Okay. So if you're a developer, can you raise your hand really quickly? Okay, great. So can you call out how many people are working on casual games? Casual. Okay, how about like mid-core? Okay, that's good. How, anyone like core or hard, super hardcore? Okay, good. All right, good. And how many people here have actually been to Asia before? Visited Asia? Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay, so not many. Um, okay, great. So as you can see by the, the slides and the program, uh, the topic of my talk is to uh, highlight uh, Asia. So given that most of you have not been there before, um, you've probably read some things or heard some things or have some idea about how it works, I would like to kind of shed some light on a little bit about what you may not know uh, based on um, my experiences there uh, at Six Wave. So, um, the organizer has also asked me to talk more about platforms uh, and, and the current market situation. So I'll try to share some updated market information. Um, the other thing is I also talk really quickly. So if you're having a hard time following, just, I don't know, point at me or raise your hand or just remember later to ask me qu uh, questions at the end. Okay? Um, so really quickly about Six Waves and, and uh, also our, our marketing agency, Amplify. Uh, we've been publishing free-to-play games since 2008, uh, so uh, well over 300 games published all over the world in, in country, over 120 countries in 18 languages. So um, most of our games have been published on Facebook and on social networks, uh, for example, in, in Japan as well. So, um, and we have a really great uh, history of cooperation with developers from, from here in Russia and, and Eastern Europe. So um, some of the other speakers today are, are partners of ours, so Playrix, Visor, Game Insight. Um, these are our longstanding partners and we're, we're really proud of those relationships. Um, so uh, these days we're a little bit more focused on, uh, on mobile. And uh, for mobile, we're very, very focused in Japan um, so, uh, and also in other parts of Asia uh, because that's where we feel like people need the most help. So as you can see, most of our presence is in Asia. Um, and, and now we're focused on top grossing games. So uh, that's going to be sort of the framework, free to play, mobile, and, and top grossing because we all care about revenues, right? So, um, so with that, um, we'll just talk about a little bit about the opportunity. So why, why is Asia important and why is it an attractive opportunity? So first of all, it's the largest market in the world for games. Um, this is from our friends at Nuzu. Um, basically, half of that Revenue comes from China, which I'll talk about right after this. But um, basically, what, what's really interesting to note is that other than the entire global games market for mobile games, uh, Asia actually it, uh, accounts for more mobile revenue than the whole rest of the world put together. So um, this is the top 10 countries right now. Um, as you can see, three out of the top four come from Asia. Um, and on top of that, uh, they ac actually lead the world in terms of growth as well. So not only is it the largest, but it's actually growing and expanding even qu more quickly. So um, if you haven't thought about Asia, now is a good time to start to think about it. So uh, how do we get started? Um, one of the things that I like to do is to help people to uh, reset their expectations about how Asia compares to the rest of the world. So I'll show you what I mean. Um, so this is, uh, you'll probably recognize this, this is a a matrix of the top grossing games. Uh, this is from App Annie. So you can go and look on App Annie anytime. So these are the largest, let's say, Western uh, markets. So this is how the top five grossing looked uh, one year ago. And as you can see, it's pretty much similar, right? So you, say, you see the same three companies pretty much in every single country. Um, and here's how it looks today. So um, one thing you'll notice is that actually it's not really that different. Um, so the top games in one country are pretty much the top ones in other countries in the West. Um, the only difference is that instead of Boom Beach, Supercell has now launched Clash Royale. Um, you see a little bit more of Machine Zone and a little bit less of King, but for the most part, it's pretty much the same players. Uh, they use a very, very similar approach um, and in the West. Now, uh, this is how the same matrix looks for Asia. So um, this is 2015, and as you can see right away, um, there is basically a completely different uh, look to every single country. So uh, in 2015, there was actually one game that only appeared in more than one country, which is Puzzle and Dragons in Japan and also in Hong Kong. Um, and basically, no leading company in one Asian market has a top five grossing game in another Asian market. So every single country is different. 
Um, the other thing is that uh, you don't see any games from overseas except for Clash of Clans and uh, Candy Crush. So um, it's very, very tough to crack Asia. So this is what I'm hoping to um, illustrate a little bit more. Um, so here's how the matrix looks for Asia today. Um, so not only is the same pattern still uh, active, like you don't see one top game from one country in another country, but the games have almost completely changed from one year ago. Um, so the top five games from one year ago are almost all gone uh, this year, except for the two in Japan and, oh, the Six Waves one in the corner. So um, everything else is, is completely different. Um, and, main, and that tells you a couple of things. So one is Asia is highly competitive. Um, there is a lot of new content coming out all the time and there's very different market tastes. Um, and the loyalty of the gamers there can be very, very challenging. So um, there's a lot of new content, and, but that also means a lot of new opportunity for new games. So um, that is the challenge of Asia is that it's basically, even though we all kind of look alike, all Asians look pretty similar. Um, <laughs> In reality, it's very, very different. So um, it is not a one-size-fits-all approach. You cannot take one game and expect it to launch and be successful in all par parts of Asia. So I um, hope you guys understand that. So um, with that said, um, so what are the most attractive markets in Asia? So um, let's start with the obvious ones. So um, obviously China, Japan, and Korea. Um, South Korea, not North Korea. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, these are three out of the top four markets. Um, basically, um, we'll start with China. So China is obviously number one. It's very massive. Um, the main problem with China, as most of you probably already heard, there is no Google Play store in China. So um, this is what the current Android marketplace looks like in, in mainland China. So this is actually much simplified. So um, when I gave uh, a talk last year and at White Nights, there were actually 400 uh, third-party Android stores. Now it's down to something like 100, just over 100. So th I guess that's good, but in a way it shows that it's very, very uh, fast-moving market and very, very difficult to manage. So if you're a developer and you're looking to really be successful on Android, uh, I'd have to say good luck. Um, you have to really spend a lot of time integrating with these platforms. And so that's a lot of SDK integrations. Um, it's a lot of testing in QA. It's integrating with uh, the, the three telcos in China to get carrier billing because it's very important. So if you're not careful, you're going to spend a lot of time managing just Android. Um, the other thing I'll mention about these Android stores in China um, is that the revenue margins are not really good. So. Since we're in Russia, I'll try to illustrate it through, uh, I guess, a Russian uh, cultural reference, uh, Matryoshka, I guess, is how you say it. So uh, imagine that this is your uh, revenue from your game in, in mainland China. So the, those third-party platforms that I mentioned earlier, they are taking 50% right off the top. So that's more than, that's more than Apple and, and, and more than Google Play. So half of your revenue is gone already if you're working with these platforms. All right, so now if you have that 50% gone, you have to actually work with a publisher because the publishers are the ones that can in help you with the integrations. They're the ones that are negotiating with the platforms to get featuring and to help you navigate the, the ecosystem. So you're actually revenue sharing with your uh, publisher as well. So from your 100%, you're really down to a really, really small chunk. In some cases, less than 20% revenue. So um, it's really one reason why I believe mainland China is less attractive. Even though everyone talks about China, 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 um, you'll get a lot of downloads in China, but you may not see a lot of revenue from your game. So just be wary of that. Um, so what about um, the other parts of China? Uh, sorry, other parts of Asia. So I mentioned Japan and Korea. So the challenge with Japan and South Korea is that it's highly competitive. And two is that the marketing costs are going through the roof. So uh, we spend a lot on campaigns globally and we're seeing the CPIs in, in Japan and Korea to be really, really high, uh, multiple times higher. So um, I'll show you what I mean. So for Japan, um, I went through and looked at the top grossing games in, in Japan. Um, these are all of the overseas or Western games in the top 50 in Japan right now. Um, so uh, you probably recognize these games, uh, Machine Zone, Supercell, and uh, Activision Blizzard. So um, what are the reasons why these games are successful? Well, they're proven strategy games. Um, as you can see, unfortunately, there's no casual games. 
Um, but most importantly, they have huge, huge marketing budgets. So um, I think Supercell has done remarkably well because their games are, are designed in a very universal way. So their characters are not, they don't look very Asian, they don't look very Russian. Uh, they just look very, uh, I guess, mass appeal. So uh, that's one of the reasons why they've been very successful. But um, King, for example, who are top grossing in most countries, they've spent eight figures on marketing in, in Japan and they're not in the top 50 grossing anymore. So um, casual games are very, very difficult in Japan, unfortunately, but strategy games are, have proven that they can be successful. Um, now, South Korea, this is how the top 50 looks for South Korea. Um, as you can see, it's quite similar. Uh, there's actually a little bit more room, and I, I personally think South Korea is more open to Western themes and Western games. Um, uh, but again, looking at the, the, the main uh, successful games, um, FIFA is actually uh, obviously massively popular globally. It's published in Korea by Nexon, which is one of the largest companies in Korea. Um, Supercell was only successful after they actually started a local team and they hired a local office to do all the, mar the marketing. Um, Hearthstone you know about, um, and these guys actually have local teams to do CS and customer support where people feel like their games are actually coming from local Korean uh, companies. All right, and of course the huge marketing budget. So where are the other opportunities in Asia? Let's quickly talk about Southeast Asia. So this is a breakdown of the Southeast Asian market. Um, it's growing really rapidly, average of 38% a year. Uh, the challenge with Southeast Asia is that uh, payments is uh, not mature. So credit card penetration is very low. So with the exception of Singapore and Malaysia, all of those other countries listed are single digits in terms of credit card penetration. So v Vietnam, for example, is like 2% credit card penetration. So um, if you take the time to actually integrate with local payment providers and you've got, let's say, a casual game, you have a decent chance of getting success in Southeast Asia because there's an exploding population there and uh, a lot of new smartphone subscribers. Um, so other than Southeast Asia, uh, I just want to highlight a little bit about Hong Kong and Taiwan, which are also in the top 10 individually for iOS and Android. So just about Hong Kong, since uh, we're located there, uh, what a lot of people don't know is that Hong Kong is actually very separate from mainland China. Um, English is an official language. Um, Hong Kong actually leads the world in ARPPU um, and leads the world in terms of smartphone penetration as well as smartphone speed. So it's actually a really attractive market. I would highly encourage you to look at Hong Kong and Taiwan. Um, the other thing I'll say is that if you look at the top grossing charts in Asia, most of them are all local games. But if you just look at the U.S. as a counterbalance, there's actually a lot more room for overseas games in the U.S. So uh, think about the U.S. as well. Um, if you look at the genres of games, um, the U.S. is a lot more diverse. Um, so you'll see um, quite a much different mix as compared to Asian markets. So if you're doing a casual game or a social casino, it actually makes sense to also look west as opposed to going straight to Asia. Um, so uh, quick word about platforms. So what are the other Asian platforms that have potential? So first one is Line. So Line Messenger is the most popular uh, messaging app in Japan. Uh, it's tremendously popular in Taiwan and also in Thailand as well. So um, they're very successful. They're unfortunately a closed platform, but you can pitch them your game. Um, and if you're able to get in with Line, they do a really great job of driving installs. Um, the other thing, which is the latest, is South Korea. So there is a platform in South Korea called One Store. Um, it's a it was formed by the three major telcos in South Korea. Um, so they're basically saying, hey, join us and upload your APK to our platform and you can immediately serve three different stores. Um, and the latest update for that is actually Naver, which is the Google of South Korea. Um, they are the largest uh, portal. They're joining the platform next month. So that could be a, another potential platform for you guys to consider, especially in South Korea where Google Play is really, really saturated because Android is dominant. So have a look at, at, at One Store as well as Line. Um, the other opportunity, we talked about China earlier. I would actually encourage you guys to look at iOS App Store in China. And the reason for that is because Apple products are really popular in China. It's an officially run app store, which is quite rare for China. Um, they take 30%, same as uh, they take everywhere else in the world. Um, so it's just run properly. And if you have a chance to try your game in mainland China, I would recommend go iOS first. Um, it runs the same way it does in the rest of the world. And you may see some surprising results. And you can go by yourself without a publisher. OK, so now that you know more about the markets and, and also the, the platforms, 
what's next? How do I get started? Right? So here are some, some key highlights and ideas as you're looking to launch a game. So first of all, understand your audience, localize your game. I'll show you a little bit more about that. Localize your marketing and localize your live ops. So basically, localization is, is my key message. So you have to understand about your game, not every game is, is potentially a good fit for Asia. So what I would recommend is talk to as many different publishers in Asia as possible if you're serious about it. Get their feedback. Um, it's very different from country to country, as, as you've seen. Um, the other thing is localize your game. So by localization, I mean much more than text. So this is a, a game called Airport City, which is uh, from our partners at Game Insight. So uh, this is how the Airport City characters, in-game characters look. Um, so we've worked really closely with the Game Insight team. They've been spectacular uh, as partners. And this is the version that we've launched in Taiwan and Hong Kong. Um, and here's how the characters look. So um, as you can tell, it's much different looking. It's much more Asian. Um, we actually spent a lot of time back and forth with the Game Insight uh, development team to make sure we got it just right. So um, this is the type of, of localization that we're talking about uh, for in-game characters. Um, in addition to that, you can even localize uh, between different parts of Asia. So this is a game that we've launched in Hong Kong. Um, we adapted and launched the game in Japan as well. And even between Hong Kong and Japan, we changed the graphics. So um, for myself, I don't have the eye to tell what's good for Japan. And our Japan team is very, very good. Um, but their tastes are very specific. So what we've done is actually, um, this was the creatives for the same game in Japan. And we actually ended up using the Japanese graphics and creatives in Hong Kong because Hong Kong players actually respond better to the Japanese marketing materials. So, because it feels cool because it's from overseas. Um, so even though the game is very localized, the graphics can come from other parts of Asia. All right, um, quick word about uh, localizing your marketing. So this is the key difference between Asia and the West is that offline marketing is equally important. So. Uh, this is how the online looks, for example, in the key markets that we're talking about. So every single country has their own local vendors, local channels, local marketing partners, and it's a lot of work to stay on top of these. So you really need a local partner who can help you manage this. Uh, I'll give you a second to take the photo. Um, so the other thing I'll mention is that offline is really important. So, and why is offline really important? Uh, if, for those of you that have not been to Asia, this is kind of a typical day in different cities in Asia, it's very, very crowded. In fact, it's disgustingly crowded. Um, and I get a lot of complaints when people come visit. Um, it, because it is so crowded, it's super important to have your game visible offline. So um, I'll show you what I'm talking about. So this is some examples of some campaigns that we've done in subway stations in Hong Kong and also in, in Tokyo. Um, you, could, you do a lot of outdoor billboards. So I was telling a developer yesterday, I was in Taiwan two weeks ago, and we went to a club, and I went to the bathroom, and in front of the urinals, they have TV screens, and these TV screens are showing video game trailers and ads. So it's everywhere. And you really need to be visible offline in order to have your game be taken seriously by local players. So um, it adds legitimacy to your game. And if players see that, OK, this is a really big budget game, they're doing offline marketing, uh, then I should really check it out. It's really cool, right? So in some cases, de depending on the timing, et cetera, we'll actually see more effective CPI from stuff like television commercials. Um, so TV is really important. In the West, you, d you tend to do TV commercials after your game's already big. Uh, in Asia, it's a little bit different. You actually have to incorporate that earlier in your marketing campaign. Um, so the final word, which I'll say, is to localize your live ops and community. In other words, take care of your players. So when you, when you want to have um, something done in your game, if you, you run into a bug or you have feedback for your game, you don't want to feel like you're talking to someone overseas. You want to talk to someone directly. You don't want to you know, just have a Zendesk ticket or whatever. You want someone that can actually speak to you in local slang and local dialect. So we believe that actually taking care of your players locally makes a huge difference because they'll be very, very loyal and they'll, much, they'll feel much more comfortable speaking to a local person as opposed to someone outsourced in India or some other country. Um, it makes a huge difference because your key players, your whales, um, your top you know, 5% of your players will generate two-thirds of your income. So um, you, even if you're planning to launch your own game from overseas in Asia, see if you can localize your CS and take care of those players. Um, so those are the kind of keys to success for, for Asian markets. Um, I think that's pretty much it. So any questions? Okay. Sorry, it's a lot to cover. But... 
отлично. Hi, thank you. Uh, well, I have two questions. First, speaking of translation into the Chinese language, uh, which dialect of Chinese would you suggest? Uh, can we just pick one, simplified or Mandarin, or we can't? Right, that's a really good question. Um, so it's actually very different from country, from country to country. So if you're looking for mainland China, uh, for the text it needs to be simplified Chinese. Um, but in Taiwan and Hong Kong, it's traditional Chinese. I'll see if I can find a slide that illustrates this. Um, but anyway, for, um, for spoken, like spoken language, audio, uh, Mandarin is used in mainland China and in Taiwan, but Cantonese is used for Hong Kong. So it's all messed up. Um, well, so it really depends on the market that you're planning to, and the app store that you're planning to launch first. But it actually makes a huge difference. So when we localize our game, to uh, it, in Hong Kong in Cantonese, your country manager really appreciates that, right? For Apple or for Google Play, okay. and that will actually help your game's chances of being featured. So it makes it, it, it. I guess the answer is if you can do all of them, do all of them. But it depends on which country you're looking to to go uh, live in first. Well, a slide would be really helpful here because I okay, couldn't distinguish it from. Hold on one second. I will find it. And uh, for example. Um, if a user sees the game in another dialect that he is accustomed to, does he take it as a fence? Hold on, I'll show you real quick. Whoops. Uh, this one. Sorry, go on with your question while I pull up the slide. Uh, well, if such a situation happens that a user sees your, uh, my game in another dialect that, that yep. he is uh, accustomed to, right. uh, does he take it as an offense? It depends. So, um, so if you are in Hong Kong and there's a game that looks like it comes from mainland China, that's not going to work. There's a lot of anti-China sentiment in, uh, in Hong Kong. So, um, but if it looks like a Japanese game, that's cool because that's cool. it's kind of, you know, there's some cachet with that. So it's a very, uh, I guess, culturally specific thing. So it's, it's kind of like assuming that you know, every country in Eastern Europe is the same as Russia, which it's clearly not, right? So there's subtle differences and things that you'd only know if you're actually local. Okay, yeah. and finally, um, re returning to the game genres, you had a slide where you had the distribution of um, different game categories per right. genre. Right. So that slide was only for the US, right? Because I didn't see yes. it for the Asia. Yeah, yeah. Do you so have a comparison? I, yeah, yeah, so I do have it in Asia. Um, it's pretty much all strategy um, and RPG, which I will pull up. Uh, one second. Sorry, I have a few presentations. Okay, so this is the one that you're referring to, right? Right. Yeah, so as you can see, Asia in general, in, at least in these top grossing markets, it is very RPG and strategy heavy. So um, and, and the point of this slide was to show that um, if you have, let's say, a more casual game, um, it may be more, uh, make more sense to try it overseas or try and there it are, in a market like that. There the are US. no casino games here at all. Pardon me? There are no casino yeah, games casino at all, right? Is, uh, it's just not popular, and not in popular. some countries it's not allowed. So, yeah, it depends. Okay. Yeah, there are some, like there's some poker and things like that, but they're, it's not that popular. So it makes no sense to release a slots game in Asia? Uh, it's tough. Yeah, we, we've actually tried that. Uh, the ROI is not great. Not great? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. thanks. Are you doing social casino? Or? Yeah. Okay, we can talk more later if you want. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah thanks. Okay. This is great. Usually I get no questions. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, what about premium games in Asian markets? Doesn't work, unfortunately. At all. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I think your best bet with premium is actually to just release it. And if it's really high quality, I think you're noticing in, in the app stores that these are starting to, uh, to be surfaced and featured a lot more. Um, I don't think you need a publisher for a premium game um, because it's very difficult for anyone to scale. Uh, mm -hmm. a premium game as opposed to free to play. What about if I gave um, the first part of my game for free and then I ask players to buy that's, it? That's possible, for, yes. For, okay. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's not a bad idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Um, hello, thanks for the talk. Uh, sure. I heard that uh, Pachinko is huge in Japan. Yes. Does their work at the mobile as well or not? Yes. Uh, actually, if you look at Japan, the top grossing casino or casino category is all Pachinko. Yeah, uh, we launched a, a traditional Western slots game in Japan, and we localized it and everything, and it did okay, but we could not get to the top five or top ten. 
uh, because it's all pachinko. Yeah. Uh, we still have time for a couple more questions. Anyone? Okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, my question is slightly off the topic of the main uh, discussion here. In the West, we regularly have uh, like uh, simple one hand, uh, one finger hits like uh, crossy road, like flappy birds, yes. uh, all these kind of days which are only <coughs> last for one month. Uh, do they also take off in uh, the Asia, or there are different games like that, or people do not play um, it like those that? Those games are, are tend to be popular as well. If they're very viral, you have a chance, but the life cycle is very short. You did bring up a really good point about the one uh, finger mechanic. That's really, really popular in Asia, in particular uh, in Japan. So most of the top games in Japan, they're all in portrait mode. Um, and that's mainly because uh, most people are riding in the subways and the trains and mm -hmm. they're just playing with one finger. So if you have a game that incorporates such a mechanic, it's actually a really good thing. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And maybe a last question? Anyone here? Okay, same oh, seven. Oh, oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. Coming back. <laughs> okay, buddy. Thank you so much. One question. Um, what do you think about games which is uh, connected to the internet all over the game time? I mean, for example, some uh, card battlers which need to be connected. Uh, we have some um, experiments with uh, China partners and they told us that our game is not very suitable for China market because it's not a very good uh, chance to have it because it's not a very good um, connection with 3G and or with 4G. Right. Yep. Yeah, that's a problem that's quite unique to China because the country is so massive and depending on where you are, the, the coverage might not be good. So it is um, certain publishers or stores in China have those set requirements. I'd say for other countries, so Taiwan, Hong Kong, Japan, South Korea, the infrastructure is so good that you are okay if, if you're uh, worried about the connection speed, that's okay. Uh, but the other thing is if you, if you support the offline, then you welcome potential fraud and people messing around with your game. So you have to kind of balance that opportunity cost. Thanks. And one more question because sure. I don't see more wishes. Okay. Um, uh, we've talked about uh, casino games and slots, um, but like, inter what do you think about collectible uh, card butlers um, uh, in Asia? Because some of our yes. Asia partners told us that it could be interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, for a long time, card-based games were very, very popular, especially in Japan. Um, so anytime you have a collection element involved, that's a very strong monetization mechanic. So um, you're seeing that incorporated now in games like Clash Royale, right, where you're trying, people are trying to unlock that rare card by spending and spending and spending. So um, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, card games are very uh, attractive, especially attractive for Japan. Yeah. And from a development standpoint, it's a little bit easier as well, right, because you just keep releasing new card packs. OK, so that's pretty much it. Thank you very much, Thank Stefan. You guys. Oh, I